Here with me this morning, please. Chapter number one. Second Peter chapter number one and verse one. Second Peter one one. The Lord said, Peter, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he certainly has. Wouldn't you like to have Peter here this morning? Would you like to have the Apostle Peter standing right here? And the Apostle Paul standing here and the Apostle John right up here. Do you have anything you'd ask them? Like to see them? If you know the Lord one day, you will see them. Amen. Then, of course, you'll see John the Baptist too. First Peter, Second Peter, chapter number 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, what follows is a list of what it takes to mature in the Lord. Father, bless your word now. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. The Apostle Peter says in verse 3 that all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Have you lived long enough to find out life can get very hard? Have you lived long enough to realize that you may have enemies? Have you lived long enough to realize that the plans you make sometimes will just shatter before your face and it won't go that way? Have you lived long enough to find out that the earth can bring, this world can bring forth some real surprises that you didn't expect? The Lord said, do you know not what a day will bring forth? Have you lived long enough to find out how weak you are? How prone to sin that we can become? What a frail thing that we really are. Have you lived long enough to really understand that and confess that before God and come to Him in that fashion instead of thinking up some religious junk and offering up some beautiful prayer? I've prayed some pretty prayers to them. You wouldn't believe. I mean, I've prayed some pretty prayers and, and I've memorized some good long prayers and I thought, boy, the Lord must be impressed with that. No, He's not. No, He's not. That's back when you're a baby, you pray like that. You're praying to impress people. Don't ever pray a prayer where you think you're going to impress somebody with it. God's not interested in being impressed. He searches the heart. He knows the reins. There's only one that knows the motive of the soul, even if you don't. He does. All things that pertain to life and godliness, life can get hard. I've lived long enough to know that. I've lived long enough to see things happen that I can't understand. I've lived long enough to see things that I just absolutely never thought I'd ever see in my life, like what's happening to my country. I never thought for a moment when I was 17 years old I'd ever see this in the United States of America, but here it is. I'm a pragmatist. That means that I live and face and deal with a situation. Not that I like it, but I simply have to deal with what's going on. That's pragmatism. I don't agree with it, and I don't like it. I don't like what's happened to the country, but I do this. I live here till he comes. So the Bible says all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. So the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking through the Apostle Peter. And he's telling you that what I'm going to give you is what you're going to need if you're going to live for God. If you're going to grow, if you're going to learn, if you're going to face the problems, the wind that blows, and the sea that rages. That's what life is about. And so what follows is some simple things. They're very simple, and sometimes the simple things are the things that we have a hard time with. Some folks try to make hard everything there is when it's really simple. Notice what he says in verse number 5. Beside this, give all diligence. Add to your faith virtue. Now, if you believe in Christ, if you are really a believer in the Lord Jesus, if you're not believing in the concept of Christ, or the Christ consciousness, or the Christ of your Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, uh, whatever it might be, a, a systematic theology, but you really believe in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Apostle Peter says, do this, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. What is virtue? Virtue is that reaching down deep inside your soul and giving of yourself, giving of your wealth, giving of your time, giving of who you are to help someone else. 
If you can't see those that are in need, that means that you don't understand the heart of God. There are many in need. There are in great need. And my friend, we are not here. We are not here to be those that feed the world. But if we could, we would. Because I don't want to see a hungry soul pass before me. I want, to, I want to help everyone that I possibly can. And this is the virtue. If you don't have virtue, the Bible teaches here, you can't build anything else upon it. This is a structure where one must follow the other. You must understand what you're here for. Why am I in life? What am I living for? If you live for yourself, you're the most miserable person on earth. You certainly are. And let me tell you this again. If you are in love with yourself, you're not any different than anyone else out here in the world because they love themselves. The Bible said no man ever hated his own flesh, but he loves it. If a preacher has pointed you to self-love, get rid of them because I don't care who they are because they are, they are absolutely brainwashed and they want to be accepted by the current culture. Don't love yourself, dear friend. Love Christ. Add to faith virtue. Note carefully now. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Knowledge is a knowledge of God and of man. God's never failed me. But if I get my eyes on men, I'll fail. It fails every time. I may, I may put too much stock in somebody. I may listen too much to what they have to say. I've learned that you hear people and you're going to hear them. And there's not much you can do about that. But get alone with God. Take your Bible, get on your knees, and seek out the face of the Lord. Let God give you wisdom. Any man seek wisdom, let him do what? Let him come to God. Let him call upon the Lord. This is, this is what he's talking about here. Faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge. Knowledge. There is a knowledge of the world that is a wicked, godless, vile knowledge. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They know everything there is to know about science, engineering, mathematics, and all of that, they think. Yet they are as ignorant as they can possibly be. And the Bible says to knowledge temperance. Temperance is self-control. That means that you learn self-control. You may get angry over a situation, but you don't have to show yourself. Somebody said, well, I just have to speak what's on my mind. A fool, the Bible says, speaketh all of his heart. A fool is known by his many words. They multiply words. Ask God to give you wisdom. Self-control sometimes. Just walk away from a situation. Self-control is a very gracious virtue. They say that probably of all the people on this earth that have self-control, the most self-control are the British, the English. These people are very, they're, they're, they're careful at how they reply and respond to each other. And you know, my friend, I'm not here this morning to brag on the British, but I'm up here to tell you today, we live in a barbaric culture. They say anything they please about you and you cannot fire back at them. You have to understand that when the Bible said they riled, they railed against Christ, he answered not a word. When they took him before Pontius Pilate and Pilate took him out and said, Echo homo, behold the man. He simply stood there and was before them as a sheep led to the slaughter. This is exactly what happened. We would find that we would get along with each other a whole lot more if we started exercising self-control. You are not God's policeman. You are not God's judge. You are not the standard of righteousness. And some people think they are. You think when you walk into a church, you can judge everybody in that place, yet you have no idea what kind of life that they have to live, the pressures they're under, the strain they're going through, the problems that they face or what they may soon face. Self-control is a very, very important thing because it has to do with your growing, your growing. You see, I do your faith virtue and virtue temperance. And then temperance, self-control. That's what we're doing here. We're talking about self-control. And if you can't add to these things, if you can't build upon them, you'll never reach a place of maturity. And it's important that you understand what maturity is about. The Bible says in verse 5, Giving all diligence, add your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. Patience. Wait them up upon God. Don't make it happen. I've had people say on the preacher on time, study the Bible, got to get out and win souls. You know what Billy Graham said? He was a 90-something, 90 90-something-year-old 90 man when he passed away. Preached to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people. But here's what he said. These are his very words. He said, I wish I had studied more. 
Think about what he said. Think about that. I wish I had studied more. I wonder what moved in his heart to make him to make him say something like that. You see, my dear friend, this Bible is your heart and your soul. It's your life. It's the voice of God speaking to you. It's telling you who you are. And yet Satan will drive you. Satan will give you every reason in the world not to study and read the Bible. The Bible says, patience. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Mount up as eagles. There's a waiting upon God. Wait upon the Lord. Wait upon God. Cry out to Him. Pour your soul out to Him. But wait upon the Lord. He said, My way is not your way. My thought is not your thoughts. Heavens are higher than the earth. So are my ways than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. And I, folks, am one who needed that. Because I'm the kind of person that gets it done. See it, do it. Don't him haw around about it. Do it! But sometimes you can't do that with God. You gotta wait on him. You gotta somebody say, Well, I'll make things happen for the Lord. God doesn't need your speed. He doesn't need your speed. What we're gonna get done, we gotta get it done. No, you don't have to get anything done. Just pour your heart and soul out to God and live for him. He'll take care of the getting done. He'll take care of the timetable. He'll take care of it. Patience. 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 That's tough in a generation where it's push button, push a button, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, Facebook, uh, all the rest of the social media. And you get in, you get around people and, there's, and it, it's amazing to walk into a room and here sit seven or eight teenagers and they don't have a clue who's in there. They're looking at this thing. They're glued to it. They're addicted to it. That's how I feel for you. I feel sorry for you because life is passing you by and you don't have a clue what's going on. You folks that have Facebook friends, fake friends. My wife calls it fake book. <laughs> and she's pretty good about that. Facebook. So you see all these friends you have on there. All these friends. Folks, a friend is somebody that you can see, touch, hear have a personal relationship with, interaction with. When you hurt, they hurt. They come to your aid. Not a bunch of this stuff that gets on there. Most people, they become a friend on Facebook so they can reach in there and learn what they can learn so they can pick at you, so they can get this, get that, and then run to some other Facebook page and give it all out. Facebook is a, is a what do they call them? A tattler? It's a tattler's paradise. The slandering, slandering. A lot of people today are scared to death because they're afraid of what somebody's liable to say about them on, on social media. Couldn't care less what they say about me on social media. Not less. Patience. Patience. God's had to teach me patience. He teaches you patience when you're lying flat to your back in the hospital room. You can't get up and do anything. He teaches you patience when your heart begins to skip and you have no strength and you're just literally poured out like water. That's teaching you patience to have to wait on God. I've had to learn to wait on Him. Have you learned that yet? Have you learned it yet? Have you learned it yet? If you haven't, you can't grow to the next step. And what is that? Well, look what it says. And to patience, godliness. What is godliness? Godliness has to do with your attitude toward life. It has to do, is the Lord in this? Is this? Is God going to be pleased with what I'm doing? Godliness. How am I living my life before the Lord? It's not what I can get away with. It's not what the crowd's doing. It's your convictions. It's not what if somebody says, well, it's legal. It's got to be okay. There's a lot of things legal that are not okay. Amen. Amen. Believe me, there are many things that are legal. Don't ever let Caesar dictate to you what's right and what's wrong. Don't ever let Caesar set the standard for morality and righteousness. That comes from God and the Word. Amen. The problem with Caesar is that Caesar always seizes and wants more power than Caesar should have. Amen. And that's why the Lord said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Well, what a thing. In plainer words, if it doesn't belong to Caesar, get out of here, Caesar. This is not yours. And let me tell you what's the most precious thing to you parents sitting in this building right now. Are those little children. They do not belong to Caesar. They're turning us against each other. They're teaching that garbage, a critical race theory. Yes, they are. 
They're teaching, they're teaching these kids that they ought to be ashamed of how they were born. Well, let me tell you something, children. You are what God made you. Regardless of the color of your skin, you're what God made you. You shouldn't be ashamed of what you are. Red, yellow, black, and white. God made you that way. You should be able to walk before the Lord and have fellowship with God. No problem. Don't let these brainwashed, demon-possessed, so-called teachers turn you against each other. Amen. Critical race theory. My, what a piece of garbage. But I'm glad to see this. You ought to see some of these mad parents when they face their local school boards. Man, I mean, you can't write that. Some of these mothers, they let them have it with both barrels. And good for them. Those kids do not belong to you, state. They don't belong to you, teachers. They don't belong to you, Knoxville. They don't belong to you, Tennessee. They belong to God. And then he loans them to you. Amen. They don't belong. And some folks today, it's so sad, but you've been brainwashed to where you think that the government's got authority to reach in to your children and do as they please with them. No, they don't. Come from God. Come from God. But notice what he said. To knowledge, temperance. To temperance, patience. Patience, godliness. And godliness, brotherly kindness. This word brotherly is Philadelphia. That's a Greek word, by the way, if you didn't know that. Philadelphia. Is there anywhere in the country called Philadelphia? Did you know there's a Philadelphia, Tennessee? It's not too far from me. I don't figure how far it is. Philadelphia. Phileo Adelphos. It's the two, conjunction of two Greek words. Phileo is the word for love, but it's a brotherly type love. And Adelphos is the Greek word for mankind or man. So it is the love of mankind or the brotherly love that we display in the house of God. Between the, uh, This ought to be a place you come to to get something you need. We should love each other. Amen. We're not, we shouldn't be in here judging each other. Let me tell you something. You may be walking high right now. You, 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 you may have everything under control. You may feel like that life, you may feel like that life owes you something and you're better than that crowd around you, but you may get one phone call and your world come crashing down. Love of the brethren. I'm going to tell you something. You'll find out how much you're growing in the Lord when you find out how much you can love each other. Because some folks aren't lovable. If you love them because of their character, you'll find out there's some of them you just don't love. If you love them because of the way they've treated you, you'll find out you just don't love them. That's where you got to have something greater than you. you got to have something from God. God, help me. Because I don't love old so-and-so like I ought to love so-and-so. Give me the grace that I need to love them the way that I ought to because they may need me. I may have to go to their side and pray with them. I may have to go to their side and give them comfort. I may have to be there in their darkest hour. And they may have treated me like a dog all the time I've known them. But I may be called upon by the grace of God to do something above and beyond my human ability to love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have a dog fight week after week. What did he say? By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have what? Philadelphia. Phileo and Adelphos. The love of the brethren. We ought to love our brethren. You ought to love each other. You really ought to. Because when you walk out into Babylon, when you go out here in Babylon, my dear friends, make no mistake about it, they don't love each other out there. The Bible teaches that they hate each other out there. One just shot to dead a bunch of people today and this morning in Florida. This past week, I don't know how many people have been shot to death. They shoot them to death. They kill each other. If we don't have something better than that in here, we're hurting. Now here's the last one. Notice, all of these are steps of a ladder. They're reaching higher until they reach the highest place. And what is that? Look at it carefully. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. 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 There's a lot of words for love in the Bible, but agape, el, agape el is the love of God. And that's a gift. That's a gift from God. The love of God constraineth me. Not, 
Not, not, not, you know, what motivates you? What did you get up for today? To make your election and your calling sure. Do you know your place in God's world? And do you know your place in the body of Christ? Do you know that you know that you're born of the Spirit of God? This is the church of God. The pillar and ground of the truth. Salt of the earth, the light of the world. Right here. Not Washington, D.C. Not Nashville, Tennessee. No, no, no. The church of God is the light of the world. The salt of the earth. The pillar and ground of the truth. Now let's see what's happened to it. Look in 2 Peter chapter number 2. And verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed, and they're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. Now watch this, verse 12. This is as plain as speech can be. But these, open your door and look outside, all right? These are as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Later in the same chapter, he talks about the dog and he talks about the swine. The whole chapter is dealing with the truth that they had and the truth that they turned away from. Look at verse 20, 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Isn't that something? These are contemporary music artists. Singing groups all over the country. They're everywhere. They're renouncing their faith in Jesus Christ now. And they're saying that they're following the, uni following the universal Christ. So what is that? That's Hinduism. That's the New Age movement. So what is the universal Christ spirit? Preacher, it's not a person, it's the spirit. It's the Christ spirit. It's the Christ spirit that originates in the Kundalini yoga through the, through, the talk, through the chakras that rise all the way up to the crown of the head of the individual. Once it reaches that point, he understands, he or she understands that they are one with that spirit. They have the universal Christ. He is whatever he needs to be to whoever you are in whatever part of the world you are in whatever religion you have. The universal Christ is that Christ spirit. These people are turning from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to that. What do you think they got that from? What do you think they got that from? Listen to this. Whatever is God or whatever is God is not something that is separate from the higher awakening of the human body-mind. Any who see God as something that is separate from human beings does not see real God, but a God of the mind, a God of the book. It is in the higher awakening of a couple mechanisms in the brain's location known as the pineal gland and the pituitary glands that this God state of being is awakened. This is pure Hinduism. This God state of being is awakened. That's what Kundalini Yoga means. Kundalini is referred to the serpent. That wraps itself around. Yoga is the idea of being yoked to something. That's what the word means. That you receive a higher understanding of who you are. The Bible is no longer the book of God, according to this man and the rest of them. The Bible is an antiquated, anachronistic, 
piece of old literature written by Jews 2,000 years ago that might have had some kind of application to them and their culture of the day. But to us, oh, no, no, no. We are far past that. We are enlightened. We know who God is. God is us. That's what these people are saying. That's exactly what they're saying. I want you to watch this. This is the way it works itself out. I got an email a couple of days ago, Pastor Lawson. I fell to my knees and wept over this. Our churches are being overtaken by perverts. A Baptist church in Bloomington, Illinois, celebrates Drag Queen Sunday. Features a drag queen. Church was featured in the April issue of the Religion News Service. Spotlighted the drag queen of the church who is the director of operations who goes by the name of Miss Penny Cost. Play on words. As a drag queen, the church held a drag Sunday on April 11th in which drag artists sang, prayed, and performed. A drag speaker during the service said the goal was celebrating and uplifting the voices of drag artistry within the church. Drag itself, the speaker said, is divine. Are you getting a hold of this? Divine. See what's happening? It's becoming religious. Homosexuality is becoming a religious thing now. Why? Because of the Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness is relative. What does that mean? It means that I could, it means whatever it means to me, that's what it is. So if this is what you feel and it's good for you, good for you. But I have my concept of God and Christ, and it's nothing like yours. I can have any kind of a church I want. It makes no difference. As long as I feel good about it. Here's a letter from another one. This is to Charles Lawson. Our modern church. No, this is a different one. I did some research and I was reading this. Our modern church. Now listen to this. For December 2020, listen carefully. The big church I attend has a budget that needs to bring in at a minimum of $100 million annually. That's a pile of money. What's that mean? It means that they have an albatross around their neck, that they have a burden upon their soul, that they've got to raise $100 million every year. I wish it were not true, but verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, expository preaching and teaching will not keep the crowds and finances coming in. What keeps the crowds then? Topical, motivational, feel good, humorous, destiny, prosperity, Jeremiah 29, 11, sermons with cherry picked verses from all over the Bible are the norm. Oh, and don't forget to use whatever translation out of the 50 or 60 available. Watch this. That says it's exactly like you need it to say. And make sure the kids are having fun. You know what that just said? Do you know what that is? That's a condemnation. Not all, but to most of the mega churches in our country. You watch them. But it doesn't have to be a mega church. It can be any church. It doesn't have to be a mega it can be any church that they water the word of God down and when they water it down it loses its power Paul said to preach Christ and him crucified listen carefully turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and I'll close here with you but I need you to read this with me 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 because this is so important Verse 7. The Bible says in verse 6, And know ye not, no, and now, and now ye know that withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. In other words, it's like the little boy with his thumb or whatever it was in the dike. It's like the chains on the on the on the gates. It's like, it's like you can feel, the, you can feel it. It's almost ready to just explode. And there's just a little bit holding it back. That's America. And then shall that wicked be revealed, 
whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but at pleasure in unrighteousness. These are the ones who turned away from the truth. That's who they are. They're damned. They got no hope. Once you turn away from Christ, the only thing left is death. And as Peter said in 2 Peter, the dog did his vomit and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire natural brute beast that have turned away from the truth and have gone right back to where it all started from. God help you. God help us. God help every one of us today. Don't be part of that. You have a choice to make. It's your life and your soul. It's your eternity. Please, please, please turn as hard as you can against the spirit of this age and come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only hope we have. Father, in thy name I pray. Bless your word. Bless your word. Bless your holy word. Do whatever you want to do in this place now. In thy name I pray. Amen.